Yeah. All right, there it is. That's right. So, well, it's good for me to be back here. Last week, of course, we took uh, a week off uh, from the book of Luke. But now as we come back to it, we'll be looking at verses 14 through 30 this morning. And as we do so here, we have a, uh, we have a change, okay? Because what we have seen so far, so the book of Luke, many of the very opening chapters are very well known. Uh, the reason that they're well known is because uh, they are, if you will, the, the Christmas passages which you look at, or the nativity passages which we look at. And we have, of course, we have the, the birth of John the Baptist, and we have this miraculous uh, birth of, of John the Baptist because his mother is beyond her childbearing years, but God allows us to happen. And so John is born, and John, of course, is going to be grow, and he's going to be the herald for the Messiah. So he is the one who prepares the way. He is the one who announces but not to be overshadowed, because what we have then is we have John the Baptist, who we, are, we see his uh, beautiful, uh, um, you know, the pregnancy comes about, but we also have uh, one that comes next. And the one which is, comes next is the one which is uh, given to us, and the angel Gabriel comes and he announces to Mary, and, is, and she says, oh, by the way, uh, you shall conceive. And she says, I, <laughs> how is that possible? I'm, I'm a virgin. And, he's, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what we have here is though we have this great miraculous uh, birth to be in John the Baptist, now we have this incredible, unique, and only conception of Jesus Christ in Mary. We will see a little bit later in our chapters, and again, we see this really in the first three chapters, we see uh, that uh, Jesus is born, and as Jesus is born, we have the angelic group, they will come and they will announce to the shepherds that there's one very special born in Bethlehem wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so the, 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 the uh, shepherds will make their way over there. And so we see Jesus and he is seen by shepherds. We see a little bit later on, about eight days later, when they take him to the temple, we see that Jesus is seen by Simeon who gives an announcement, a prophetic announcement. And Anna as well, she glorifies God. We will see a little bit later in the, in the further chapters, what we'll see is we'll see that Jesus, even as a teenage boy, he goes to the temple. He's 12 years old and he gets lost there, or he doesn't get lost, but everybody else loses him, let's put it that way. And we see that he's interacting with the, you know, the priests and the teachers there at the temple. It's pretty miraculous. He says to his parents, don't you understand that I should be about my father's business? After this, we see that Jesus, he is taken or he goes out and he goes to John the Baptist and it is there that he is baptized. And when he is baptized, he is baptized not as a sinner, but he is baptized as one who is anointed. He is starting his ministry. He is the anointed one. Not only is he anointed with water, but the Holy Spirit comes down and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And we have the voice from heaven says, that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. If this were not enough, what we have is this same Jesus is immediately taken by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, and the, and the devil wants to go ahead and tempt him. And we see that Jesus, he fasts for 40 days, so much so that I get the humorous line, in my opinion, in the book of Luke, where it says, and he was hungry. Some of you are still hungry from your breakfast. <laughs> and here we have Jesus after 40 days, and he is in a weakened state, and he, now he is tempted by Satan, and Jesus responds and responds and responds with Scripture. And so Jesus shows that he is no tinfoil bridge, as I said, but he is the one who's reliable. I mean, that's what you have here. So if you're only looking at the Gospel of Luke and you look at chapters 1, 2, 3, and the first part of 4, this is what we have so far. Here we have this incredible one with this incredible resume, and if you were just to look at just this little bit, you'd say, my goodness, what in the world is this? So we have all of this, and Luke is putting up all of this information, giving us his resume, if you will. And now, as we turn, like I said, we're going to have a change as we come to the 14th verse. What we'll see is that Luke is going to go ahead and talk about the ministry of Jesus and its beginning. Now, to be fair, some people say, well, is this the beginning of Jesus' ministry? This is the beginning of the ministry which, which Luke is presenting to us, although Luke himself understands that Jesus has already done some other special things beforehand. He understands that we get that in the very same text. But he is presenting this as the very first ministry, especially in his hometown. And so here we have Jesus, and Jesus is coming, and he's coming back home. And as he comes back home, we think, okay... Now we're going to see some stuff really happen, and some stuff is really going to happen, but perhaps not like you think. 
We come then to John, or not John, but we come to Luke. In Luke chapter 4, we pick it up here in verse 14. And Jesus returned. This is coming back from his temptation, if you will. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him through all the <clears throat> and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. We see now it has begun. The ministry of Jesus, the public ministry of Jesus, as presented by Luke, has begun. And as he comes now, he is coming back to his hometown. And he's got some things to say. It is interesting for us because he puts it right after the fasting. And we see that Jesus is said to be coming in the power of the Spirit. And I don't doubt for a moment this is the power of the Spirit. It's what Scripture says. That's easy enough. But keep in mind, this is a man who's fasted for 40 days. This is a man who is emaciated. This is a guy who looks a little bit like a walking skeleton. Sometimes, I mean, you watch The Chosen, for example, or something like that. And, you know... No big argument with that, but when you look at him, he looks pretty healthy. I'm here to tell you that when Jesus comes back to town, he is not, he is not beefy. This is a guy who you can see the ribs. And as he's coming into town, he may be in the power of the Spirit, but physically he is relatively weak. So here he comes, and he goes to the, t- to the synagogues, and he begins to teach there. Now, the synagogues, of course, we must understand that this is the synagogues. Synagogues, think of those as almost like a local church. The temple is the one big giant building, and, and uh, you, you've got a platform, you've got all kinds of stuff. You have all of that, and you have that in Jerusalem. But here we have him in the synagogues, and he's teaching there. He's teaching in his hometown in Galilee. And you're like, well, okay, so, well, this is like a three-day walk from Jerusalem. So we need to remember that he is up, if you will, up in the sticks. He comes then in the spirit of Galilee, and a report went through uh, all the surrounding country, and he taught in the synagogues, being glorified by all. The people are pretty happy. Hey, awesome. We got this great teacher. This is fantastic. So all the people are very excited about this. But I need you to understand that you have to be very careful about the initial impressions that people have about other people. I was reading a book called Well-Intentioned Dragons by Marshall Shelley. Marshall Shelley, he's writing to pastors and giving pastors wisdom. It's a very helpful book. And one of the things which I will never forget, he writes this. He says, always be careful about the person who runs out the door to shake your hand first when you come to a new church. I thought, well, why, why, why is that a bad thing? He says, the reason why is that the guy that runs out the door to grab your hand first and shake it and be so enthusiastic about you is probably the same guy who was enthusiastic about getting the other guy out. And a little bit later, you might be that next guy. Be careful. Well, here we have Jesus, and they're pretty excited. Here comes the homeboy, and he's made good, and they're very enthusiastic about it. But I think you need to go ahead and put a little asterisk next to this because they're not going to be too excited later on. Here comes Jesus. It has begun. The ministry has become. He's come to his hometown. Things are going to work out fine, right? Hmm. No. Verse 14. Or excuse me, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth. Once again, we are in the sticks. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. and And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, we don't know exactly what the ceremonies were like in a synagogue. One of them, of course, was the reading of the Torah or reading of the law or reading of the prophets. And what you would do is somebody would be the reader, and there you would go. There would be somebody who was in charge. A synagogue was made up of at least 10 males that were 13 or above. If you didn't have that, then you couldn't have a synagogue. Well, here is Jesus, and it's a very Jewish town. This is not a problem. He comes there, and he is evidently the invited guy to come up and to speak. Goes into the synagogue, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet of Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. So here you have it. It's a big deal. Most of your people probably don't have their own little scrolls of Isaiah. I mean, you guys all have your Bibles, but they don't. And the big scroll is given to him, and he probably has like a little pointer so he doesn't ruin the pages, and he's going to read from Isaiah 61. And he reads this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set the liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. 
So we have this here, the reading of Isaiah 61.1, but I want us to look at Isaiah 61.1 because he goes just a touch past verse 1. So we turn to Isaiah 61, and what do we find here? And if we read the passage here, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and the opening of prisons to those who are bound. That's pretty good, right? We don't have any issues with that. He even continues on into verse 2. Still, we're okay to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus has, is saying all of these things, but I want you to look at what follows. The words which follow are this, and the day of vengeance of our God. He doesn't say that. And as Jesus gets the reading, and as he reads the scroll for them, it is positive, is it not? Yeah, it's all positive, but he leads out the day of vengeance. I believe that Jesus stops there because if he says the day of vengeance, we would see Jesus and we would see the wrath of Christ. But what we have here is he's coming with promise. The people here are not thinking two comings of Christ. They're thinking of only one Messiah. But I think what we have here is that the fulfillment will come in the second coming. Nevertheless, Jesus comes and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. We saw this already in the baptism of Christ. And he says, To proclaim the good news to the poor. Well, the people of Nazareth very much qualify as the poor. They are the sticks. They are the poor of the poor. One of his disciples will say, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Because Nazareth is nothing, right? All right. I mean, Nazareth is, is the Auburn of today's world. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to which they say, well, that, that makes sense to us. That's good. Because we're captives. We as Jews, we are under the occupation of these evil Romans. We don't like the Romans. And the idea that the Messiah would come, the idea that he would come and that he would proclaim liberty to us, yes, it's exactly what we want. We want a militaristic Messiah to come in here and to take care of business. Fantastic. We get that. He says, and recovering the sight of the blind. Hmm. I wonder if Jesus means that metaphorically or literally. What we'll find is that both, right? Amen. Yeah, because we know that Jesus will heal several blind people and obviously on a figurative level, obviously, he opens the eyes of the blind. And lastly, he comes up to set to liberty those who are oppressed, to which again is very similar to the second one. We are oppressed. We're oppressed by the Romans. So here he comes, and he's going to take care of business. We are so excited. We've been waiting for him. We are living at the pinnacle of history. Isn't that awesome? The Messiah has come. In our time, the Messiah has come. Let me ask you this. Any of you excited that Jesus would come before you die? I kind of like the second coming when Jesus comes, or the rapture. I'd love to see any of those type of things happen before I die. I don't know if I'm going to or not. But these guys are like, here he is in our little town of Nazareth, out in the sticks. Pretty good. So they're pretty happy with themselves. He rolls up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant. The eyes are, are, are fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, okay, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What? Come again? What? By the way, look at his sermon. I may get fired if my sermon was so short. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't I? Or maybe I'd become very popular. I'm not sure, certain. But look at his sermon. It is, I mean, I'm counting the words here. I, it's not very many. I mean, it's, it's countable. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. There it is. Whoa. Now, keep in mind, all of this is very positive. He hasn't talked about the vengeance thing, so that's a, that's a positive. And some people say, well, the people are a little upset that he doesn't talk about the vengeance part. I don't think so. I think it's they are, after some initial thinking, unimpressed with his audacity. Wait a second. Who does he think he is? Because look at what he said, well, the part afterwards, verse 22. And all the people spoke well of him. Now, the word spoke here is the word for testify, okay? They were, it's an imperfect, they were testifying about him, okay? And they were marveling about him. They were marveling at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. So it looks pretty positive, right? It looks pretty good. And they said, hold on a second, isn't this Joseph's son? There is some ambiguity here in Luke because we, 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 we say, are they being positive? Are they being negative? Or what exactly is going on here? 
And I believe it is both and, but ultimately negative. I think what we have here is people that are saying, oh, okay, um, that's, uh, that, that, that Jesus, he does great things, he speaks well, and he, I like the way he read, and, but hold on a second. Isn't he? He's Joseph's son. How, is this, how in the world is he saying that the scriptures have been fulfilled right now today in our hearing? Does that really work? And you say, well, do I have the right call on this? Am I seeing this under, or understanding this properly? Well, let's look at the complementary passage in Matthew. So go over to Matthew with me. And in Matthew, it has a slightly different wording, but it describes the account. I mean, you could even make the argument when they say, is this not Joseph's son? Maybe they're just surprised, but they're not being negative. Well, hold on. Get to Matthew, and I think we see the full intent here. Matthew chapter 13, thank you. Matthew 13, and then we'll look at verses 53 through 58. Starts in 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, coming to his hometown. There it is. And he taught them in their synagogue. There it is. So that they were astonished. They, were, they are marveling, right? All the same thing. And they asked this question, where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? It's the same thing. So you're saying, well, maybe they're just, they're just surprised. Read on. Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where did he get, this, all, all, get all these things? Maybe they're just surprised. Look at 57. And they took offense at him. If you want to know what they're thinking, it's, it's difficult for us sometimes because we're on the outside, we don't know exactly what people are thinking. But when our scripture tells us, aha, here's what they're thinking. They're not simply curious. When they're asking the question, is this not Joseph's son, what they're being, is they're being derogatory? Hold on a second. How can he say, how can he be so presumptuous to say that now in our hearing that things have been fulfilled, is he trying to claim something for himself? Hmm. What Jesus is going to do then at this particular point, I mean, we would like to think you come to your hometown and you got this good resume that you're going to be most accepted, but I'm here to tell you that as he comes to his hometown, he's going to be most rejected. Not only is he going to be most rejected, they're going to, be so, they're going to reject him so much that he will reject them. Oftentimes when people, we look at Jesus, and I have this in my own room. I think I've used this example before, but I'll say it again. I, in my room, we have a, a, of a shepherd, and he's got some sheep, and it's all in pastels, and it's very artistic, and it's very pretty uh, in my house, in our bedroom even. And it has the, you know, the, the Lord is our shepherd, you know, Psalm 23. It's very nice. And a lot of times we like to think of Jesus as the pastel Jesus, the calm and easy Jesus, right? I had a church back in the Tri-Cities. Their logo was of Jesus laughing. And we like to think of Jesus as the laughing Jesus. I'm here to tell you, hold on a second. Uh, Jesus is no fuzzy wuzzy. And I'm here to tell you that as he comes to his hometown, he's going to pick a fight. No, no, Jesus, Jesus he wouldn't do that. He, he, he wouldn't pick a fight. He wouldn't do that. Yes, he is. Jesus is coming at this particular time to pick a fight. You're like, well, but, but nice people don't pick fights. Sometimes they do. Sometimes you have to pick a fight because you have to get around the things which are blocking them in their faith. You have to stir them up. And what Jesus is going to do is that Jesus is going to say some very inflammatory, in many respects, insulting things to them in the hope of getting around their unbelief. It's true. Because what they see is they see Jesus, the son of Joseph, misunderstood as the son of Joseph, but that's who they see him as. And they're not appreciating who he is, the anointed of God, their very own Savior. And he said to them, Okay, well, let me respond to you guys in your thinking. Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. <laughs> what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So like I said, they, they know of Jesus doing some other ministries else play, elsewhere. But now he has come home. And they're saying, you know, physician, heal yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of the people around you. Take care of those nearby. 
It's, it's the hometown people are the ones who need to be taken care of first and foremost. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to break this idea to pieces. He's going to say, you know, <laughs> you guys think that you are the promised people, that you, you, you come from Abraham and you, and you have all of this lineage and you're all good. And therefore you can trust in that and that's a mistake. John was telling you the very same thing. Turn with me back to Luke chapter 3. And in Luke chapter 3, when John is clearing the way, what does he say? He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He says, you think just because of your lineage of your background, that you're going to be perfectly fine. And he says, nonsense. I'm here to tell you that it's not about your background. It's not about your nationality. It's not about the fact that you are from my hometown, that you're good. The only way that you're good is with a relationship with me, but you don't even understand who I am, the people who should know best. Jesus gives us a principle. Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Hmm. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. You know, I think about that sometimes. I, I sometimes think, you know, what would it be like if I went back to my hometown to be a preacher where I was at? I thought, well, I'd have a lot of advantages because I go back to my hometown and, and I could be a preacher there and people would know me and I'd understand some of the customs and things like that. But I also realized that in many respects, oh, you're Stacy that grew up here, and then be the idea of, we can reject you. We knew you when you were a boy. When they're looking at Jesus, this is the Jesus who played ball in the yard. This is the Jesus that they watched when Mary and Joseph were on a date, you know? And here we have people that are saying, no, no, that's Joseph's son, that's Mary's son. We're, 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 not, we're not following him. This, this can't be it. We knew this guy when he was young. He can't be the one. Hmm. And Jesus is saying, well, guys, I am the one. And let me give you a couple examples. You keep on saying we're special people and you don't need anything. Let me give you some examples of why you're not so special. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Now we know this story here, or hopefully you know this story. This, we find this in 1 Kings chapter 17. And after Elijah basically says there will be a drought, and for three and a half years there's no rain in Israel, and people are thirsty to say the least. There's droughts, things are not going well. And what do we find? Is we find that Elijah the prophet does not stay in Israel, but he goes north up into the Phoenician region, he goes up into Sidon, he goes up there, and he finds a widow there. And if we read the passage, what we find is that there was a woman there, and she's collecting sticks, and Elijah says, hey, why don't you give me something to eat and to drink? Well, let me tell you, um, are you going to give a stranger something to eat and drink when you're dying? But she is willing to do it. She says, well, I'm collecting these sticks to make the last that I have of some bread, have the oil, drink a little bit, and we're preparing to die. And he says, make something you need to eat and drink. And she provides it for him. And what we see is that the simple act of faith allows her to go ahead and survive because we see that the oil continues, and it continues, and it continues. Elijah doesn't go to a widow in Israel. He doesn't go to the promised people. He goes outside. And these people are saying, but we're the promised people. We're the ones that get all the benefits. We're, in, we're okay. And Jesus is saying, wrong attitude. Just because you have a certain lineage, a certain background, does not mean you get anything. The reality is that there's a foreign woman and she had faith. I guess another example. Elijah went, uh, excuse me, 27, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, 
but only Naaman the Syrian. God decides once again in the Old Testament through Elisha to go ahead and to have an enemy general of Israel heal the leprosy. Why not a great Jewish general? No. He picks an enemy of the people. What we see here is we see a couple things. Number one, they're not as special as they think they are. And number two, we see that God has compassion upon people who you wouldn't think would have, he'd have compassion upon. These guys think that they are the sole beneficiaries of, of the promises of God. And what Jesus is saying, no. The axe is laid at the root. He's going to do some clearing, guys. You think you got it all set? You're wrong. I came to your hometown, and you're discussing who I am, and you're excited at first, but now all of a sudden you're saying, ah, yeah, but then again, you're not that good. You're just Joseph's son. No. He is blowing them up, is what he's doing. He is trying to blow up their preconceptions. Hmm. Well, at this particular moment, at this particular moment, as Jesus blows up their preconceptions, their prejudices, all of that, as he blows it all up, they now have an opportunity. And with the opportunity, they can say, well, yeah, those are tough words. I don't like them very much, but I'll accept them. Yes, Jesus, uh, we saw you grow up, uh, but we know who you are now, and we know that you you preach the right thing, and you heal the right things, and we've seen all of the reports, and yes, you are the one that God has sent. You, you are the Messiah. Yes, we'll take, we'll, we'll take it. And that's their opportunity to accept him, but they do not. Wherever you're at, you always have the opportunity to make decisions. You do. Amen. You have opportunities. Whether you're going to take the opportunity or not, that's on you. But there it is. What we see, unfortunately, is that the people do not, or they take the wrong decision. When they heard all of these things in the synagogue, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. That's pretty amazing. They're furious at him. A few verses beforehand, they were marveling. They are saying, wow, that's pretty incredible. But Jesus says, well, okay, um, let's, let's cut to the chase here. I need to pick a fight because you guys see things wrong. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. They're pretty serious about their zeal. And they're going to take Jesus and they're going to go ahead and throw him down the, down the hill. They're going to have him killed. I remember when I, we were visiting in Israel, they have a, you, you have to be careful when you go on these tours in Israel. You know, there's a tour, there's, as I've told you many times, if there's something holy, they build a church on top of it and ruin it. Uh, but uh, I remember we went to the town of Nazareth, and they had this high point, you know, and they said, well, th this is where we think that they were going to throw Joseph. They don't know. They, they, they don't know. But here they are. They found a high point, and they're going to uh, throw him off. In verse 30, by, uh, but passing through the midst, he went away. Now, how did that happen? I don't know. People say, oh, he vaporized. <sighs> or he turned into, I don't know. Did he roll himself into a carpet and somebody carted him out? I don't think that's what that means either. Okay. I don't know how it works. Okay. It's, really, it's not on me to understand the dynamic of how he passes through the crowd. Okay. It's not told me. I don't know. That's what I'm telling you. He does. He gets through. How? I don't know. That's not that important. But what is important here is we see here that he goes. Now, again, we look at this crowd of all the people who should know best. It's this crowd. They're Jews. Jesus grew up amongst them. They know his brothers and sister. They know who Mary is. They know who Joseph is. They know all of this. Of all the people who should know best, that Jesus is special. They hear him speak. They, 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 they hear the greatness of his words. Of all the people who should know he is the best, it's them. Isn't it? But he came unto his own, and his own received him not, according to John 1. He came unto those who should know best, and they didn't believe. I'm always amazed, you know, you, you think, you, you think of, of others who come to Christ later on. You think of uh, the book of Acts, and you have the, the Ethiopian eunuch, and he is looking through Isaiah himself, and he's like, what is all of this? 
And here is this man who is evangelized by Philip, and boom, he comes to Christ. He's a foreigner. He's an outcast. He's a eunuch. He's a guy who's unclean, and yet God changes his heart. Here are these people, and what they're doing is they're resting on their laurels because of who they are. We're the promised people, and we're good. And Jesus is like, I, I, I got to challenge that. And it's going to make you mad. You, matter of fact, it's going to make you so mad you're going to try to kill me. i got to get your attention. Sometimes we, the people that we love, we have to infuriate to get them to see clearly. In John chapter 3, everybody knows John 3.16, I like, which is great. But I like to read the passages afterwards, too. In verse 18, it says, But whoever, or whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The light has come into his very own hometown. And the people love darkness rather than light. Because their works are evil. Their beliefs are evil. Their unbelief is there. Here we have Jesus, the light of the world. The light of the world. And they want nothing to do with it. I think I've told you this before, but I remember when I was a, a, a teacher in West Africa. And I used to teach in the downtown little library which the mission had built. And I would drive downtown... And the only way to get into the back gate to where the library was at, when I say library, it was a small house, which is smaller than the front of this, this, this church here. And as you're going to go ahead and you're going to park your car in the back compound area so it's not vandalized or stolen, you have to go down an alleyway, and the alleyway is full of garbage, so much so that at different times it would be higher than a man. And I remember to driving down that particular alleyway, and I had to get out of my car, and I had to unlock the gate, open up the gate, and then I would drive it in. It was not a desirable place. It was full of garbage oftentimes, and because it was full of garbage and nobody wanted to go there, the drug addicts were all over the place there. And as I would get out there to get there, I have my students who were already inside, they begged me, they say, please don't do this anymore, please don't do this anymore, please don't do this anymore, because they believed that their Bible teacher was going to get a knife in the back pretty soon, and somebody's going to take his Jeep, and it's all going to be done. And quite frankly, they're right. But it's like, but that's okay. God will protect me. Got to watch out when you say that too loud. <laughs> One of my men, his name was Gustav. Gustav was so concerned about it, he was an electrician, and he went out and he, he wired up a light and so that it would beam all the way out into the alleyway because uh, he didn't want his professor to be dead. I always thought that was nice. When the addicts saw the light, the addicts have a couple different reactions which they can have. They can embrace the light, but none of them did that. They could run away from the light, which, which most people did. But there were those who would go ahead and they could throw stones at the light to break the light. When Christ comes and he shines his light upon the people. They're filled with wrath and they hate him. How dare he go ahead and think little of them? Doesn't he know who they are, the promised people? And they want to kill him for telling, for he telling them they're not as good as they think they are. You'll have that in your world, ladies and gentlemen, as you tell people, and you tell them about the sin problems which they have, and they'll say, but yeah, but I'm a good person, and they'll hate you for it. They try to kill the homeboy. They try to kill the favorite son. They want nothing to do with him. <laughs> he goes unto his own, and his own receive him not. The people who know best reject him. Where are you? Do you sometimes say, well, I'm good, I'm fine, because mom and dad believed, and so therefore I'm fine? 
well, I'm good because I've gone to church since I was a little boy or a little girl, and so I'm fine. Or I'm good because I went to a private school. Or I'm good because I have a cool pastor. Or I'm good because I'm an American. Or I'm good because I recycle. Or whatever the case may be. And we have these wrong ideas sometimes in our mind that we are okay because we, we do this or we do that. The only way that you're good is that you are accepting the one who is the fulfillment of Scripture, which we read about right here. Amen. He's it. He's it. And you can't rest upon your laurels, and you can't rest upon your preconceived ideas, and you can't rest upon your privilege, and you can't rest upon your identity unless your identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen. See? And Jesus is saying, hometown, don't you understand? Here I am, and I am the fulfillment. And we've got this, this, this whole resume which is built up, and here we are in a pinnacle at his hometown, to which they say, no. And I'm here to tell you, you need to say yes to Jesus. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, today is to say, Lord, forgive me for what I am, for who I am. I'm not telling you to take pride in who you are, pride in who, what you do, pride in your nationality, pride in your... I'm not telling you about doing any of that. I am telling you to understand that Jesus is great. And you need to shed yourself of everything else and say, I will take Jesus. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Forget about everything else, but come to him. Come to him, you see. Jesus comes to his hometown... And his hometown rejects him. But in many respects, as Jesus gives these stories of the, the Syrian general who is healed and the widow who is blessed, in many respects, what Jesus is doing is rejecting them, for they have not come to him in faith, but only in their privilege. Do you know him? Do you know him? Go to people, evangelize people, tell people. Don't tell them that, oh, the church is great because we have great potlucks, though we do at times. Go to people and tell them, our Jesus is marvelous, and he's what we've been waiting for, and it's him that you need to know. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand for prayer. My God, may we be a people who are not denying you before people, but a people who are professing you before people, that you will profess us before the Father. You who are a great, great Savior. You who are a great, great one. Help us not diminish you at all. Sometimes I think that's somewhat of our, a challenge for us. We have read the Bible a lot. We're familiar with the stories. We're familiar with things. It's almost as if we become so familiar we are forgetful about the living Lord Jesus. My God, I pray that we would strengthen our bonds, strengthen our relationship with you, appreciate who you are. And Lord, may we live lives which are transparent, telling people about what you have done in our lives, hoping, my God, that they also will see you. For we want nothing more than to have others come and join the Savior. You are the one who is the fulfillment of it all. May we point to them and may they enter into eternal life with us. This we pray in Christ's name.